So hi everyone and good afternoon. Uh, we start today our connections uh, series and uh, the series hosts faculty from CMU who already teach a micro course for uh, the CMU in Qatar students. And this fall, because of the travel restrictions and the pandemic, our micro courses and the lecture series are virtual. And today's lecture uh, is the first for this semester and is pre presented by uh, Jonathan Chapman. And Jonathan is a professor and director of doctoral studies in the School of Design at the CMU. He directs the PhD in Transition Design, a research program for designers committed to making a positive change in the world. He has written four books on design, with a fifth on the way. His books explore design's capacity to leverage positive change in the world and provide tools and methods for designers to enable the transition to a sustainable future. His latest book comes out with MIT Press next summer. As a circular design specialist, he advises many global businesses, governments, and NGOs from Sony, Puma, The Body Shop, and Philips to the House of Lords and the United Nations, advancing the social and ecological relevance of their products, technologies, and systems. His work in design and sustainability has generated international and media attention from the New York Times, The Guardian, The Independent, CNN International, and BBC Radio 4. New Scientist describes him as a mover and shaker and part of a new breed of sustainable design thinker. We are fortunate to have Professor Chapman with us today, so uh, please join me uh, in welcoming him to the session this afternoon. And uh, the floor is yours, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salma. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this session, which, as was mentioned, will be is remote. I'm sorry I can't be there to, to meet you all in person and uh, experience the, the joys of your wonderful campus. I, I'm currently running um, a, a three-unit micro course with a group of your students engaging the topic of design thinking. Um, and the last couple of sessions have been excellent. I've been so it's uh, so enjoying running the class and your students are really delightful. Um, and uh, I should also share with you that they, they all speak so highly of their experience uh, there and the kinds of things they're learning. And yeah, it, feel, it feels like a, a really fantastic place. So I'm sorry I can't be there in person, maybe next time. So I appreciate you joining this session uh, and giving your time to this especially in a, at a time like now where um, all of us are perhaps feeling a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Um, it's, it, it's, it's tough, so I, I appreciate you joining. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, I'll try not to go over. Um, and then we'll have some discussion at the end. So uh, because it's not so long, uh, if you can save your questions to the end, that would be, that would be great. But if, as questions come up, you want to drop them into the chat, then that's sometimes a good way to, to record them for later. And we'll, 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 um, we'll open it up later on. Uh, so yeah, so, so let's make a start. So design for the circular economy. So in, in design, we're, um, you know, much of the time we, we're kind of questioning current systems and dominant systems in terms of how we design the world and, and make the world and experience the world. And more recently, also thinking about how we destroy the world and damage the world, you know, with our uh, recent awakening to some of the more problematic social and environmental consequences of uh, our relentless sort of pursuit of innovation. And so there's an interesting contradiction there, which design is becoming aware of. Um, about how can we continue to engage meaningfully with innovation, with change, with progress, but at the same time, how can we do it in a way that is less harmful um, to people and to the planet and so on. So a lot of our work is about that. And this talk specifically looks at the circular economy. So anyone interested in this, the, probably the first question I ask is, well, what's a circular economy? And I'm sorry if you all 
already know this or um, one or two people on this call might even be specialists working in this space already. Uh, but it's interesting because even people working in this space already still ask this question, you know, like really what is a circular economy? Um, what I can say is that the best way to understand a circular economy is kind of to compare it to the alternative, which is the linear economy, which is to say that we've been living and working in a predominantly linear economy for about a century, possibly a little more. Um, and with a linear economy, what we're doing is we're, we're thinking about material um, and energy in a very one way, single use process. So the linear economy is kind of characterized by a straight line with social and environmental destruction at either end, whether it's at the start where we mine resources, extract them, process them, produce component parts, which themselves get shipped to form larger component parts, which themselves later become products, which then get used, usually for a brief period of time, and which then get discarded often in ways that can't be recovered or recycled. So it's this kind of straight line, single, single use, highly wasteful, highly poisonous and destructive process. Um, and so what Design for the Circular Economy is kind of asking is, how can you take that straight line and kind of bend it around to make more of a circle so that, sure, we still use material. I mean, I don't see mobile phones becoming purely immaterial anytime soon. I don't see cars doing that. I don't see toasters doing that anytime soon. You know, there are just certain physical things that we kind of use and need. Um, but the way that they're made, we can certainly think about doing it in a more circular way, which is to say that the materials that uh, are deployed to manufacture and produce these kinds of things have a second life when that product eventually needs replacing or repairing. And so that isn't just about recycling. I mean, recycling is part of that, and we all know about recycling. Um, but it's also about product design and the way that we design products themselves, because actually most products aren't really designed to be disassembled to that extent um, and so we can talk about something highly complex like a smartphone and we can say well sure we just need to get better at recycling taking things apart at the end of life that will crack it surely I'm like well yeah it would if those products were designed so that that can happen but as you all probably know a mobile phone is um it, i mean it's a very complex cocktail of minerals and resources and materials most of which are locked together in a way that is inseparable they can't really be separated out um, at least not in a cost-effective way largely to do with the design of the products themselves uh, because product design is still operating in this industrial revolution mindset where we we, we put things together we sell them and we don't need to worry about it. Let's go and make some more stuff. Whereas now we're saying, actually this stuff, when we sell a product, it continues to be the manufacturer's responsibility even after it's been sold. And so we now need to invest much more in the design and manufacture these things so that when they come back to us at the end of life, we can actually deal with it. We can actually take it apart, refurbish it, recycle some of the valuable materials in there, which are becoming increasingly scarce by the day. Um, so it's a slightly different way of thinking about supply chain. It's a different way of thinking about design, manufacture, but it's also a slightly different way of thinking about consumer responsibility and how when a person buys a product or leases a product from a brand, they're sort of custodians of that material for a while. And, and they, exchange that material back and forwards between themselves and, the, and brands. I'll show you some examples in a few minutes uh, to help kind of personify that idea. So this, what you're looking at on the screen here is this kind of, um, it's, this, it's this fairly, I don't know, it's a, quite a classic example in industrial design that where we talk about, you know, almost two thirds of the periodic table you will find inside a smartphone. And what's particularly troubling about that because in some ways it's impressive you know when you think about you know 
human ingenuity and how on earth we've managed to create things that do what smartphones do. It's pretty incredible, really. But there's a sort of a dark side to that. There's a kind of a shadow that that casts, which is that behind each uh, mineral or element that finds its way into these products, there's a, there's a social story, you know, there's a, there's a context somewhere in the world where these materials were mined, pulled out of rock and mud and processed, usually with the, you know, by the fingers of young children in unregulated parts of the world where there is no protection or policy to protect uh, the rights of people. And yet these materials are bought by some of the largest uh, companies in the world to produce high value products, which we all enjoy. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else. And so there's this really complex story of material that flows through our products, which most of us are unaware of um, for obvious reasons. They're not the kinds of stories that brands like to talk about. We, ha we are, however, starting to see a slight change in that where um, companies that actually want to do something about this, such as Apple, for example, is very, you know, Apple are the easy target when we want to talk about unsustainability. You know, it's quite common to use Apple as a, an example of a company that stimulates artificial need or um, constantly re releasing very slightly newer versions of the same product as a way to stimulate consumption, you know, and we know that. But if we're going to categorize businesses like that, that probably captures about a third of all retailers that do operate in that way. I mean, just look at fast fashion or any of those kinds of things. And so Apple's just another example of a company that has become incredibly successful based on many things. But one of those things is rapid throughput of products, um, marginally different models. So Apple actually have a really aggressive circular design campaign inside. They're not very good at talking about it yet, um, but they're doing a lot of work on um, making phones and laptops, um, iPads, things like that in a more modular way where when the product has returned to the brand, they can be disassembled really quickly um, and the valuable materials can be recovered. Um, some parts can actually just be cleaned and put into new phones. I think a typical smartphone is only about 10% of it that actually needs to be changed for the next model up. So it's kind of interesting how when we discard a product such as a smartphone, so much of it shouldn't really be discarded. It's only the bits that are now obsolete. Um, so there, so I'm sorry if the video is a bit jumpy because Zoom doesn't always do this very well, but um, so I'm not sure quite what you're seeing, uh, but you know, Apple have developed this um, automated line um, where the products have been designed in such a way that certain kinds of machines can handle them, scan them for, for wear and tear, recycle, even simple things like nickel screws which if you imagine you've got a company that sells a few, uh, hundred, a few hundred million units every quarter, something like a screw is actually quite important. Um, so customers are not really aware of a lot of the activity happening behind the scenes at Apple in terms of the way products are designed, the way they're um, recycled and taken back. Um, but many, many businesses are doing exactly what Apple are doing. I don't have time in this talk to share it with you, but Nike, uh, Nike have this phenomenal um, circular plan called um, the Circular Design Guide, which is a, a really good rep representation of a really quite a cool brand that has an aggressive and, and highly active design philosophy within the business. And they've developed their own design guide, which is based on circular principles. But what's special about Knight's design guide, sorry, circular design guide, is, um, is that they've shared it openly as a platform and design students all over the world are just feeding off this stuff constantly all the time. Um, many businesses like IBM have a circular program, but they don't share it. Um, and I think a lot of businesses are already starting to think what would our circular design program look like you know because what works for apple wouldn't work for dunhill or um, louis vuitton for example you know so it's kind of 
in the end, everyone needs to sort of make their own program, which makes sense for them. And some companies seem to want to share it and some don't. Um, so moving on then, because a, a smartphone is like, I'm going to talk about smartphones again in a minute. I'm a bit obsessed with them. Um, and one of the reasons I'm a bit obsessed with them is uh, I worked in furniture design for many years, you know, a long time ago. And um, working with sustainability issues in furniture, I would say is it's not easy, but it's easier than something as complex as a phone or a laptop or a, or a speaker or a pair of headphones, you know, electronics. And in a way, I realized at some point that you really need to get into electronics if you're going to tackle things like e-waste, obviously, and issues surrounding conflict minerals and things like that, which are the things that concern me most, I have to be honest. And so I, I tend to be quite interested in electronics, but hopefully if you're listening to this, you'll, you'll see that many of the principles that I'm talking about are quite transferable to other sectors or other kinds of products. Um, so here's an example of the Lamy fountain pen, which is one of the simpler, you could say it's a much simpler product. It has complexity within it, no doubt. Um, but what's great about this object is that it, it provides a really nice example of what happens when you have a product that the user themselves can take apart. So you don't have to return it to the brand to be disassembled and recycled like you do with the iPhone. This actually engages the customer in that process and in so doing, you open up the experience of the product, you open up a different kind of relationship with the product. And the owner of this product, sure, you could say there's some inconvenience attached, but it feels worth it because your sense of ownership and your sense of pride in maintaining and keeping a thing like this that works well is, is that bit higher. There's also some very tangible advantages to a, a product like this where you can replace parts, you can refill it, from a glass jar of ink when it empties. You know, there are just some things about this product which make a lot of sense. And so we talk about this product quite a lot in design school, not because the biosphere is collapsing because of an excess of fountain pens, not because of that, but because what this product does is it sort of shows you an example of how it's possible to think quite differently about the way we make things and the way we use things. And it doesn't have to be a humble, apologetic, you know, green product that looks awful, but it's good for the environment. You know, it can actually be something pretty slick and pretty interesting as well. So we talk about things like this a lot. Most smartphones, most smartphones are like uh, those disposable pens you get at hotels for free. You know, most, most the design philosophy behind most electronics is that. You know, use it for a while, become disappointed by it and throw it away. So here's a, back to smartphones again. Here's an example of a circular electronic product that does what the Lamy fountain pen does. So this is actually going all the way and inviting the customer to be the person that dismantles, replaces, upgrades, services, the thing itself. So, so Fairphone was a, a startup from Amsterdam that opened in 2013 and it's now a pretty big deal. I mean, it's kind of, I was at my last time I went to the, to the doctors in the UK, my GP had one on his desk and what was quite cool was he left it on his desk in a way that it was really visible so that people would ask, you know, Oh, what's that? And he would then get to be proud of the fact that he bought this campaign object. that's a little bit activisty, but not too much. So it's kind of interesting how you design a product like a smartphone, but which has a very different ethos and it's got its own social and environmental agenda and it's not hiding it. You know, it's interesting how people start to weave that into their identities a bit and it becomes so much more. So just very quickly, Fairphone, what's good about it is two, well, two main things. So one is, um, one is that it's modular which means that it can be taken apart actually quite easily uh, with a little crosshead screwdriver. And actually many of the parts just come open without a screwdriver at all. Um, 
So things that commonly fail on smartphones, you know, like the battery doesn't really hold its charge anymore, or maybe the memory module needs to be upgraded, or perhaps there's a better camera available now. Um, what it means is you can replace just that bit. So rather than having to replace the entire platform, you actually just replace the bit that needs replacing, which is a profoundly different approach to what we're used to, you know, 1% of this phone feels old, I'm going to replace all of it. Um, economically, we've been doing all right based on that approach for a while. Um, but as soon as you factor in environmental and social conditions, it, it, you realize we haven't actually been doing very well on that approach at all. We've been causing havoc. And so um, this product, I think, is really interesting uh, because it it shows that it's possible to launch a brand and develop a completely different type of customer for this essential product. You know, we, most people need a phone, right? I mean, yes, you can live without a phone, but it's kind of better if you have one. Um, and so what they're doing is they're showing that it's possible. You know, you can do it. The earlier model of Fairphone was interesting because it came pre-made, came pre-built with instructions on how to disassemble it and, um, you know, here's what you do if you want to upgrade it or fix it yourself. But a lot of people didn't feel confident to take apart a smartphone. It's, it just feels wrong to do it because we've been trained as customers not to do that. You know, we've been taught to not tamper, you know, with electronics, right? Um, whereas actually Fairphone want you to do that, but people didn't feel confident. So then what they did is later generations of Fairphone, including the generations that are out now, is the product comes to you in pieces and it's kind of half built. And so as a customer, you get it out. It's a little like some Ikea products, right? And you, um, and you just finish off the assembly yourself. And what that does is it kind of, you now feel empowered. You feel like, oh, I built that. And of course you didn't build it. You just finalized the assembly. But as a customer, you now feel comfortable with the idea of taking it apart again, because you know it's in there, I've already done that. And so from that point on, the interaction becomes much more fluid in terms of upgrade, repair, those kinds of things. So that's really interesting from a design point of view, because in design, you know, of course, we spend a lot of time designing products, brands, uh, campaigns, um, spaces, those kinds of tangible things. But we also spend a lot of time designing intangible things like services or experiences, you know, so like the unboxing experience of this product is something designed, that process of getting these parts out of the box and learning how to make it and for it to be hard, but not too hard. All those are designed processes, which are the kinds of things that in the School of Design, uh, we're really interested in those kinds of things particularly in how we can use those kinds of interactions as a way to train people and empower people to be more, to make more sustainable choices and to make better choices uh, in their lives, rather than being interested in these things because it's a way to sell more stuff, because it is, but that's not why we're interested in it. Another quick example, which comes from a completely different sector, which is to do with children's clothes, textiles, fashion. Um, so a guy called Ryan Sashin at the Royal College of Art um, found his way into grad school and from a background in aeronautical engineering with focus on materials. He was very interested in composite materials that perform in different ways that are lightweight and so on. So he found his way into the Royal College of Art and he developed this um, textile for children's clothes that that grow as the child grows now you could kind of say that you know in some respects um in some respects you could say i don't like the look of these clothes these don't look like children's clothes and i'd say no they don't do they? <laughs> you know that's actually part of why it's interesting just like the fair phone doesn't look like the kind of phone you're used to seeing either and what's happening in design now is we're getting a little, I think people are getting a little tired of having to hide sustainability 
and having to conceal it in a way that um, kind of disguises it so it doesn't put people off, doesn't worry people. I think now the conversation has got to a stage where it's more mature and we can say, yeah, it doesn't look like a regular child's baby suit because it isn't one. It's not that. It's something else. And a lot of people are becoming really interested in this. So, so Ryan's textile uh, got bought by a large retailer. It actually isn't H&M, um, but they got bought by a very large retailer who are now figuring out how to scale up that material to create a new line of clothes which have laundry services and repair services attached to them. So you lease the clothes. Um, and when you're kind of done with it, you return it and then switch something else. So it's more of a subscription-based child's clothes service, which is really, really interesting as a different way of relating to customers, especially when brand loyalty is so scarce. People just move from one brand to the next. So to actually create products which kind of tie customers to brands, but in ways that are sort of meaningful and educational is kind of interesting. It saves, saves resources along the way too. So we're looking at the H&M logo because I do a fair bit of uh, work with H&M on their circular economy uh, program. So H&M don't talk much about this. They made a, well, it's hard to know if they made a mistake or not with their ethical collection. But one of the things that happened when H&M launched their ethical collection, which was a kind of sustainable platform at H&M where they got to experiment and try sustainable design with their, products, which is an excellent thing to do, an important thing to do. Uh, but the problem is by calling it the ethical collection, you then look at all the other products that H&M have and you kind of say, so what are they then? If this is, if this is the ethical collection, what's that stuff? And it kind of once again shows how volatile this space is, that if you're a lazy organization, doesn't try and do anything to help, then it's almost safer to do that than to take a chance and to try and change or try and engage with this debate. Uh, because people, it seems like people are very eager to, to shoot down and to drag down anyone that dares to try to, because it always comes across as a cynical greenwashing stunt or a marketing stunt. Um, so anyway, H&M have set this really competitive target that by 2030, they're going to be fully circular, which means everything that they produce comes back and gets reprocessed. That's their, that's their goal. And I believe they're even going to do it before 2030. So far, 99 point, I think 4% of all their retail stores use 100% renewable energy from local energy providers. And the only reason there's 0.6 of their stores that don't is because they happen to be in places where you can't get renewable energy. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, confusion and in design school, it's interesting because students come to us thinking they know who the, the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And actually, when you really start looking at it, it's often not what you think. And there's, there's a huge amount going on behind the scenes. Um, and gradually, I think more and more companies are starting to feel comfortable talking about it, finding the language. How do we even have this new kind of conversation with customers? Like, how do we even do that? I work with a company called COS, C-O-S, it's like a fashion, fashion brand, um, really wonderful company, wonderful people there. Um, and they, they have this interesting approach to circularity, which is also about quality and things that just last longer you know, designing things that last. And a lot of my research is about design that lasts. Um, and that when it fails or when it breaks or when something happens to it, which it will, um, it, it can be repaired. But what's interesting about repair is that I think a lot of product repair is about restoring it to its previous condition, you know, so it looks exactly the same. And there's a place for that, of course. But there's also a, a new space opening up in in design, which is products that have been designed for repair, but when you repair them, they actually get better. Something, it adds something to the quality of the object. I'm thinking of a pair of ripped 
denim jeans and how that's kind of sort of more interesting in a way than a pair of unripped denim jeans. Uh, and this example of a kintsugi bowl is, you know, it's broken ceramics repaired with gold resin is kind of like the Lamy fountain pen, you know, it's sort of like it's an object that represents an approach saying, yeah, stuff happens, you know, bad things happen, they do. And there's not, there's actually nothing you can do to stop it. We just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, COVID is a perfect example, right? Like, you know, you can, you can risk manage and you can do all kinds of things, but sometimes stuff just happens. And so it's kind of healthy in a way to, to, to have a mindset that says, okay, so when things happen, which they probably will, how are we going to respond to it? And how are we going to turn those things into an opportunity to grow? You know, like, how can we, how can we respond positively to that trauma? And I think this repaired bowl is a nice example of that. How, you know, things that disrupt and appear like problems and they are problems can also just be an opportunity to do something different. So my work with COS, a lot of what we're doing is simply that just thinking okay well how do you talk about repair with customers in a way that sounds like a process of enhancement and improvement rather than this button fell off and it shouldn't have i want my money back <laughs> which is basically how repair is thought of generally at the moment um, here's another quick example before i start wrapping up so this is a, a the yellow foot down in the corner there you might notice that there's this material you can get called Sugru, which is S-U-G-R-U, which is an air drying clay, which you can buy. And a lot of people buy it to sort of hack products. You know, the handle on a tap is a little small. My hands aren't strong enough. So you'll add Sugru to this tap to make it bigger. So now you can use it. Or in this case, the rubber foot has fallen off a toaster. So somebody made a new rubber foot. The reason we're looking at this, which seems like a really inconsequential example but it isn't the reason we're looking at this is um you can get sugru in black you know and you could have very easily designed a foot that is invisible and that nobody would notice you know you could have restored this product pretty much back to exactly how it looked before but that would be a huge missed opportunity and the person who owns this toaster loves this yellow foot and they love it when they have guests staying and the guests come down for breakfast and everyone's making toast. And they're like, oh, what's going on there? And then and this, the owner's like, ah, let me tell you about that. And it's a chance to just talk about our own ingenuity, the things we care about, the things we put effort into. You know, and it's, so now this object used to be an anonymous, you know, it's a nice object, but it's fairly anonymous. And through repair, it became unique. There's only one of these. And there's a really powerful story attached to this now that the owner really enjoys. And even when that individual owner makes toast, they keep looking at that and they remember that if this thing fails, I'm going to fix it again. I'm going to keep this thing going. And so there's something very different there about the type of ownership this kind of design enables, which is powerful. So, um, it's, you know, simplistically speaking, the circular economy is, it's about a thousand things, you know, it's, it, but simply speaking, it's about keeping materials in motion. It's about once something comes out the ground and it's in use, we need to keep it in use. Sometimes that's by designing things that last longer. Sometimes it's by designing things that can be repaired when they fail, but be repaired ideally by customers themselves. But if not, they can be sent back and repaired in a way that works. And then when things do eventually reach the end of life, which they will at some point, they need to be designed in such a way that they can be disassembled and repurposed and the materials can be recovered and used again and so on. So, so the real goal of the circular economy is to keep matter in motion or to keep material in motion. So the material is the thing that has the value. The products that, the, the products that happen through a material's life, they're important. And for customers, that's the bit that has value. But for the business, it's about the material and having good quality material that you can generate several products out of 
throughout that material's life. Um, and that's probably the biggest reframe of the circular economy with design is like really understanding that actually it's the materials that have the value and the products are kind of things that you can make out of those materials, but it's very much about the material. So a closing example is this, which is to say that, um, like I said, there's like a thousand approaches to, to the circular economy. And some of them are massive and you'll have heard about, but most of them are tiny, like little things that people do here and there. This example, I don't know if it's massive or tiny, but it is the, uh, the Tokyo Olympics, which obviously has a slightly different plan, but the medals for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics are made from gold, silver and bronze recovered from electronic waste in Japan, which is phenomenally interesting idea that you can take something worthless from a dump, you know, and you can convert it into one of the most valuable items that you can think of, you know, in one of, one of the most valuable items that you can think of. And it's interesting because the material's the same, whether it's woven into an old circuit board in a printer in a hole in the ground, or if it's sitting there in front of you as a gold medal at the Olympics, it's the same material, but it's something has happened to it. A design process has happened, which has lifted it out of one reality and placed it in another. And that's actually what design does. It kind of, it enables those transitions from one thing to another thing really, really well. And it does it in a way that feel really obvious and feel really easy to understand. And I go, oh, yeah, I get it. That's smart. I like that. You know, this, it's, it, that's one of the things that we try and do. And when design is done badly as well, it kind of does the opposite of that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Um, so hopefully that was um, a, a, a very broad overview of design and the circular economy. There's a lot I didn't talk about, obviously, but I hope it gives you a little feel for some of the spirit of it and some of the reasons why we're, we're working in this kind of space uh, and that we're really not looking for the mass answer, you know, what's the big flow chart? What's the big diagram that solves this? We're not looking for that, actually. We're looking for masses of answers and, um, and hopefully some of the examples in this talk help to give you a little taste of what some of those answers might look like. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've, uh, we'll now begin with some discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was really inspiring and uh, thinking about design as a, uh, as a way for us to, to think about a, a better planet, I guess, um, mm. was, was uh, enlightening. So we do have some questions in the chat and, and I guess we'll also take questions from uh, people in the room. Um, so Hope was asking uh, about the change. So when we uh, when we recycle products, that uh, basically they, they may not be as good because the new circular production process would focus not only on the product but also the whole life life cycle. So how do we how do we do that and how do we make this trade off? I think you talked a little bit about repair. Maybe there's more. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Hope, for your question. It's nice to meet you. I think we've emailed quite a bit. Hi. Um, yeah, so great, great question. And thank you. So um, I think this is something that it, it raises a really interesting point, because I think behind that, and I don't mean this in, in relation to you, Hope, I, I mean, all of us have an assumption that the current product world we inhabit is good quality. I think we assume it is that, and that any change to that will be a drop in quality. But actually, the kinds of products we interact with typically at the moment are not good quality. They're, most of them are, are really badly made, stuffed full of glue and all kinds of clumsy stuff that just make them last just long enough um, so that after six months or nine months they fail because we need people to replace these things, you know fabrics look tired after the first wash. Um, chairs start squeaking after you've sat in them about a hundred times, you know, there's kind of like 
The world we currently inhabit, I would say, is largely low quality. Um, and when that low quality begins to show itself through a squeak in the chair or a leaking of glue out of a seam, seam line in a product or some, something, like it begins to give itself away, um, we feel like maybe it's our fault. Maybe I'm too heavy or maybe it was that time I left my phone out in the rain. We kind of blame ourselves. And I think brands have got very good at tricking us into thinking that they're perfect and we're the problem as users. Um, so actually, I would say it's probably the opposite where having proper conversations with customers around life cycle, the fact that products do fail sometimes. So what we need to do is actually design them in a way that they're less likely to fail. But when they fail that we can fix that, we can recover it. What that does is it actually gets people talking about quality in the first place. So 10 years ago in a typical design studio, like one of the ones I used to work in, um, no one ever really talked about quality. It was just like a standard, you know, do it like this. This is how we've always done it kind of approach. Whereas now with the circular economy, quality is one of the top criteria because also as a brand, if you know you're going to have to take something back and fix it when it fails for free, um, then you're going to make sure it's better quality because that way you will have less expense down the line, you know? So I, I think you're, what you're asking hope is, is perfect thing to ask because it's, it's where a lot of our thinking is right now. And it's, it's bringing the conversation to the fore. Whereas I think before our assumption was that things are already good quality, but actually they're not. Um, okay, so then I see there's also another question. Yeah, so the next question was from Mohammed, and uh, I think it refers to the example you gave about uh, the phone from the Netherlands and how uh, mm. uh, how we uh, there was a they created a shift in how customers think uh, by allowing them to put the phone together and then disassemble, then they feel more comfortable to uh, to. Um, recycle it later and so Mohammed is saying if uh, so changing customers habits uh, is harder than changing the products themselves but manufacturers push for consumption through planned uh, uh, basically advertisement and they just keep pushing for consumption so how do you break this by vicious cycle right yeah okay. wow, brilliant yeah I mean this is again this is right at the heart of the problem is that um, is, to, is that um, how do you make more money by selling less stuff, right? I mean, you know, in a way. And I think a lot of the consultancy work I do, that's the first question that people want to know is like, okay, so what you're saying is we sell less stuff. So how do we, how do we not die as a business by doing that? And so the main shift in thinking there is to say that you're selling more experiences and less material. So, so it's a shift. In terms of what the person is consuming, they're kind of consuming a relationship with the product, they're consuming an experience rather than consuming things, if you like. So it's more of a service agreement where you subscribe to a product. And that product is like, um, sometimes we call a product like this an ecosystem. I think sometimes products are called platforms, right? They have a, they have a, a part that's fixed, a part that you keep, and then it has these other modules that can be changed constantly like this ecosystem of modules that you can update and change. And every time you update and change it, the, the product kind of feels new, but it's actually only about 5% new, but the whole thing feels new. I mean, a quick version of that, if you like when you change the desktop background on your iPad, you know, for about I don't know, two seconds, you feel like you've got a new iPad. So it's, it's kind of like the, the product is, um, continually renewed and updated thing. But in terms of money, um, there was a time probably, I don't know, 20 years ago where you probably wouldn't have made money doing this um, because there was no landfill taxation and there was no um, materials were cheaper. You know, the cost of certain precious metals that you need to make electronics was, was painfully low. And it was low because large societies were being destroyed in the process of extracting those materials you know they were they were low for a reason but now it's uh, for electronics companies it's virtually impossible to 
to just buy material once, sell it, and then buy more material once and sell it. It's just really becoming not cost effective to do that. And also when companies that make phones, for example, or any tech, when companies look 10 years from now, or when they forecast, you know, what, what does our company look like 20 years from now when there is no lithium? You know, what do, what do we do then? Or when there is no titanium, or at least there's no titanium that we can afford to mine. You know, it's not in an accessible area. We can't get it. Then what? You know, so in a way, a lot of what companies are doing now, the ones that are thinking ahead, are just getting things ready for a time where materials are either unavailable, too scarce or too expensive. So it kind of it's motivating people to think, OK, we'll buy tungsten once and we'll just keep using it because you can. And we'll buy titanium once and we'll just keep using it. And we'll buy cobalt once and we'll just keep using it. So it's more about brands becoming owners of material and then using and reusing that same material over time. And obviously each time you sell the same piece of material, your margins increase in a particular way. So it's just a slightly different way of thinking about um, what you're selling and the different kind of service agreements you have um, with customers. One of the uh, one little addition to that answer is also to talk about connecting with customers and holding on to customers once you've got them as a way to sort of increase market share, but also to secure market share is uh, with internet shopping being the dominant mode of you know, retail and consumption. Um, a person's perception of brand is quite different now than it was when, you know, I walk into a store, uh, the brand is now teaching me about the brand. I feel part of something. I think now when people are shopping, it's so much more about an anonymous object on a white background. I don't even know where I am, like what shop I'm in. I just know that I like that thing in front of me. You know, so this notion of brand is really fragile. And so developing products more as service platforms like this is, is kind of an interesting way to connect a person more firmly with a brand and to, and to engage them in more of an ongoing conversation with the brand in terms of upgrades, changes, different lifestyle options we can offer you. So this, so that, and it's too soon to tell whether that works, but a lot of the companies that are investing in this kind of platform like Fairphone are, are saying, no, no, this is, this is how it will be. You know, that you have tribes of customers who understand the lifestyle choice of owning something like this. So, um, so thanks for that question. I think that's, again, really, really insightful and, and great question. Thank you. And then, um, and then there was a question from Shadi. Maybe Shadi, I invite you to, to comment on it. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, thanks, Salma. Thank, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I think this is very interesting. And my question uh, actually follows from uh, what you just, uh, what you just uh, responded. Uh, the, the bigger, um, I think, thesis behind the question is, uh, uh, can we actually incentivize organizations to have a, uh, to, to adopt a cyclical economy in a context where uh, we only value perpetual growth? And, you know, what, what would be the incentive for an organization to say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to uh, reduce my sales, hence reduce eventually consumption, but end up with better ecological and, and social sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Again, right, right to the heart of the problem. I think it's this, um, it, and it's that balance, isn't it? Between doing something that, you know, if you've got, if you crudely say there's, you know, e economy, environment, society, you know, it isn't those three, is it? But let's say it was, I think dominant, generally we dominantly think about the economy and then if we have time or budget left over, we might then think about social and ecological things. And I think a lot of what we're talking about with circularity is placing the environment as the key stakeholder and then thinking about economic growth and social growth next. So it's a slight reorientation of the three. But no, you're right, because if you, if you only focus on environment and not economy, None of these ideas actually happen anyway. 
And in design school, we've got filing cabinets stuffed full of amazing ideas, but which don't consider the economic context. So they never happen. So what's the point? You know, so I completely agree. And so normally what happens is you, with things like trying to encourage brands to produce products that last, it's about two things. The first is, well, last how long, you know, and it's not about things that last forever. You know, that classic story of the light bulb and, you know, give people a bulb that never breaks. And then that's, then what, you know? Um, so it's not about that, but it's more about optimization. So it's about saying, well, okay, if a, if a typical smartphone lasts 18 months, and if we can make it last 20, you know, like 24 months, uh, what you're doing is you're increasing its lifespan by a third. Um, I think my maths is right. Yeah, so, so you're increasing its lifespan by a third and you're also decreasing the consumption and waste of materials by a third. So the question then is, are we decreasing profit by a third? Um, and that depends. So if you're selling a product that lasts longer to a customer that would have come back to you to buy another one, then I guess, yeah, you're probably reducing profit by a third because you're delaying the point that they spend money they don't have on a thing they don't need, uh, but with you. Um, however, if there was no guarantee that that customer would, when they need to replace that product, they would come and replace it with you. So think about footwear, you know, it's like when those pair of sneakers get tired and wear out a little too soon and they need replacing, there is absolutely no guarantee that that person's going to come and replace them with you. Maybe they'll go to Adidas or Puma or Nike, who knows? Um, but you've got a number of different brands fighting over the same customers, right? So the argument is that if you allow people to have slightly longer and more satisfying relationships with their products, maybe even including a repair point, which could be free or could be paid, what you're doing is you're developing that different kind of intimacy with the brand and a different kind of connection with those sorts of products are more fulfilling customer experience possibly. Uh, and the argument there is by doing that, when it is time to replace, the chance of that customer coming back and replacing them with you is so much higher. So it's like a trade-off. So you're probably selling fewer things to uh, over, the, over time, but you're increasing sales by holding on to customers. So you're sort of holding on to customers, continuing to sell products to them. But I don't know, I'm hoping that makes sense. I think I probably could have explained that a little bit better. Yeah, um, I think uh, yeah, like I can see how this would work, say, at the micro level, but say at the macro level, eventually there'll be less, uh, less consumption. Mm. And I, I guess the, the thesis behind what I'm asking is, do, do we need a different economic model uh, in sustainability? There's... Yeah. Many uh, uh, propositions for uh, maybe stakeholder capitalism or, or uh, steady state economy is being proposed as well. So uh, are, are we actually trying to tinker with a system that's actually broken? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. No, I absolutely think so. And this is, I think this is why, so if I talk about design for the circular economy, I think what you're talking about is also the circular economy, which is kind of like, okay, so design's a part of that. And, but there's a bigger conversation about economics at large and how, how this changes everything in a way. And we can no longer model prosperity around the throughput of material. Um, it, we could do, but that's not what the circular economy is inviting us to do. So, so at that point, it becomes a, a discussion around economics and those kinds of things, which I think is probably what you're getting at. And you're right. So if you, if you get out of design for the circular economy and just talk about the circular economy, you find there are large portions of the debate that are purely about economics. Like how do we really reimagine prosperity in an environment where material is not the prime measure, you know, GDP and so on. So yeah, absolutely. I think that's where it's at. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think we're, we're nearing the end of, uh, of, uh, of the hour. There was a, a question from Mohammed that's a little different. So maybe we can take two minutes uh, before we, we wrap up. He was asking if this applies to, so to the software industry. Hmm. Uh, 
software yeah, and quick answer is, yeah. the, the quick answer is yes. I mean, um, software is one area where a lot of, if you think about a lot of the product examples I showed you in this talk, you know, the, the toaster with a bright yellow foot, you know, that kind of customization or a, a phone that can be upgraded in a way that customers know about or a phone that can be upgraded in a way that customers don't know about. And one of the amazing things about software is that that's happening all of the time and it's doing that without material consumption or at least no material consumption on the consumer side. You know, there's still physical infrastructure to enable software um, and clouds, you know, to exist. But the idea that software is more of an ecosystem model with continual change and upgrade and adaption is, is really exciting. And actually a lot of the powerful circular economy work is happening in terms of AI systems and machine learning in terms of how can we develop different kinds of AI platform that give people the feeling of a product being new and being different so that they hold on to it for longer. Um, Cause the product itself often doesn't need to change, but the experience it delivers does. So this is where software can be massively powerful in terms of creating a much richer kind of, um, consumer experience, which people are prepared to pay for, especially if it's on a subscription model. Products that learn about the user, learn about your own life that can customize themselves to you. You know, all that stuff is completely enabled by the frictionless kind of nature of software. I also saw another quick question, which I think I can very quickly respond to before we're out of time about of incentivizing people to return things. I think, I think that's absolutely right. Cause People need a reason to bother because we, our lives are full. Uh, we're already doing everything we can, right? So why would I bother? And I think so far, that's an underexplored area of the circular economy is how you incentivize people to return products. And what's interesting is you would assume that money would be the answer. That, oh, well, all we do is we say, if you return this, we'll give you 20% off your next purchase. You know, it kind of makes sense, right? But that's surprisingly unsuccessful as a reason to get people to bother. Equally, telling people that the fate of our world might just depend on more people returning products, that doesn't incentivize people either. So it's a really interesting design challenge is how, how do you do that then? How do you get people to, to care about these things? Some people are saying people won't care about it and what you need are better collection services. Well, you know, we come to you, <laughs> but it's, so it's a very interesting, um, I mean, there are so many ideas in that space, but so far I wouldn't say there are any winners. Um, so again, another really rich area for innovation that, yeah. So thank you everyone for your incredible questions and for having a yet another Zoom meeting. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Let's uh, say thank you to you everyone. and. Uh... And this, this was a great talk and we enjoyed it, Zoom or not. I think uh, we would have liked it to be in the building here, but uh, hopefully again, uh, we'll, it, it will, we'll be able to do it soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to see you all.